All right, we're going to be going through Acts 17 this morning. And, you know, I think it's, uh, it's good, uh, you know, when you, when, you go, when you read through Acts and you see the journeys of Paul, you see he's visiting these different areas. And you, when, you, when you read the whole New Testament and you read the epistles, it's almost like, you know, in Acts, he goes here, talks about some issues, but then you read the epistle and then it goes into a bit more depth into actually what is happening in that church. So you can see here in Thessalonians, you know, it's a, it's a Gentile church. He went there, you know, it was more Gentiles that believe, so it's the Thessalonian church. He praises the Thessalonian church uh, a lot, but then he's also persecuted in these areas, in Thessalonica and Berea, and then he refers to these things in the letters to the Thessalonians. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really great when you, if you understand the, the timeline and the events in Acts, and how it lines up with the epistles, um, it just makes reading the New Testament a lot, come a lot more alive to you and, and, and a lot more interesting. So in Acts 17, we, we see three different areas that Paul is visiting here. First, it's the, in Thessalonica with the Thessalonians. Then he goes to Berea. And last of all, he ends up in Athens. So let's go through this chapter and we'll, we'll, we'll draw a few lessons from God's Word this morning. So first we're going to look at his journey into, into uh, Thessalonica. Acts 17, 1, it says here, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, uh, where was a synagogue of the Jews. So just a bit about the Thessalonians. When you read the first epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul actually thought very highly of the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians were a very, like, hard-working church. They, they walked in the ways of the Lord. They were a great example to all the churches in that region. And he actually mentions this in the epistle to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So you can see here that he praises them for their work, for their love, and their patience of hope. So patience in the Bible generally refers to going through hard times and tribulation with them. And you can see here that they were persecuted, sent to Berea, and then the house of Jason was persecuted you know, in, in place for basically harboring them when they came to Thessalonica. So here he's praising them for the, 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 their love and their work. Knowing, brethren, beloved, and your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So this is uh, referring to the fact that Paul, when he was at the Thessalonian church and amongst the Gentiles, they worked to show the Gentiles, this is how you work hard. Because you remember one of the issues that he was dealing with in the Thessalonian church was laziness. You know, people kind of mooching off the church and not working, not, you know, and he's saying, hey, if you don't work, neither should you eat. This is uh, one of the things uh, that was being dealt with in Thessalonica. And you became followers of us, verse 6, and of the Lord, having received the word, look, in much affliction, so you see, so you get some of that insight into the affliction in Acts. With joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. I mean, what a great church. You know, and this was a, a Gentile church, right? So you see there how he's gone to Thessal Thessalonica, how this church would have been founded and planted, would have been made up mostly of Gentiles. But these Gentiles did a great work. I mean, would to God that, you know, God said this about our church, that we were like the Thessalonian church, that, it, you know, nobody needs to commend or, you know, praise the church because the, the actions of the church speak louder than those words, that the love, the labor of love, the faith and the example of that church that, you know, it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, built up by somebody praising the church. It's just through the acts alone of that church, they did great things and, and were known 
You know, their faith was known all through Macedonia and Archaea. In every place your faith to God was spread abroad, that we need not to speak anything. So this is the sort of church that the Thessalonians were, Acts 17 too. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So we don't know if he was there throughout the week as well. And we know that the synagogue of the Jews, there'd be people meeting there, there'd be non-Jewish people there as well listening because that's why Gentiles were hearing what was being said as well. But notice here that he goes over three Sabbath days. So three Sabbaths in a row, he goes there, reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believe, so you note, note there in verse 4, because we'll come, we'll sort of refer to that later. So some of them believe, so what is that referring to? The Jews there that were listening. So not so many Jews believed, but, uh, and consorted with Paul and Silas. So there was a, like some Jews that believed and started sort of, you know, uh, learning from Paul and Silas and whatnot, and so some of them followed them too. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. So you see in Thessal Thessalonica, they were much more effective at reaching the Gentiles there, or the Gentiles were much more open to the gospel and humble in receiving that, that truth. And of the chief women, not a few. So one thing I just want to mention here is, you know, Paul spent time preaching the gospel to them. Um, you know, he was there three Sabbath days reasoning with them. And, and what I want to mention here is, you know, don't be impatient with unbelievers when you're explaining the gospel, when you're trying to answer questions and whatnot. Um, it can take time and they can have many questions to answer. It may, it may require additional visits. You know, if they want to talk more, you may need to go back, you know, get their details, talk to them, try and answer questions. But one thing I just want to emphasize here, because in a church that I came from, I used to be involved with, the attitude there when we used to go soul winning is they were very impatient with people, right? And maybe it's because, you know, in America, you know, in the, in the area we're in, you know, there was a lot of Catholics there. And when you went soul winning, um, you know, they were open to talking about the Bible. And you could just open the Bible and just show them verses and then they would s sort of believe because they, they may not be saved. And you may, you may have the same experience when you just talk to Christians that have just grown up in church or they're going to a church, but they believe in work salvation. So they're not saved, but they already, to some extent, submit to the authority of the Bible. They already believe it's God's word. They think it's, you know, the book that's correct, but they just don't understand it correctly. But then sometimes you'll come across people that don't have that background. You know, maybe they're an atheist, where they, you know, or maybe they're an agnostic. Maybe they're somebody from a different religion. And, you know, when you show them verses from the Bible, they're not just going to accept that as truth like somebody who has a Christian background. And what I found in this church is, like, if you, if you were talking to an atheist or you were talking to a Muslim or you were talking to a Buddhist or you were talking to just an agnostic or just somebody that had questions and didn't just, you know, oh, that's what the Bible says and therefore it must be true, they obviously would have objections. You know, they'd say, they'd have questions. They'd say, well, what about this? Or what about that? Or what? So they would start to resist what was being told to them because they have questions and objections. And this is not so much of a problem here, but I just want to address this attitude. So what happened there is, well, you know, if they weren't willing to listen, they started to becoming a bit argumentative. Oh, well, you know, you know, we, we don't have time for that. It was, that was the, the attitude. We could be talking to somebody else. Or, you know, if they don't just accept what the Bible says, they'll say, you know, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We just preach the Bible. If they don't accept it, then we're just going to move on. And the reason why I'm addressing that, because I always felt that that was not the right attitude to have. And that was not what we saw in the Bible. This is not what we saw from one of the greatest evangelists in the New Testament that was not his attitude. His attitude was not that he just preached it once, uh, if they didn't accept it, then oh, I'll just shake off the dust of my feet and go to somebody else. You see here in Acts 17 that he is reasoning three Sabbath days with them. He's actually making a concerted effort to preach the gospel, address their concerns, explain it to them, reason with them. And 
the point I'm making here is, yeah, we, we have to be patient with unbelievers. We don't want to have this attitude of we just expect everyone to you show them a Bible verse, they just accept it. If they don't accept it, that's their problem. No, because that's your problem too, to explain it to them, to, 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 to break down their objections so that they're open to listening to the Bible. And sometimes people that grow up in a very Christian area don't experience that. They just, ex they just assume that everyone believes the Bible is the Word of God. But when you live in a very multicultural society like Australia, not everyone has that upbringing, right? So, so it's not just about going there and preaching the plan of salvation, and if they agree with it, they agree with it. If they don't, that's their problem. No, we sometimes have to explain to them you know, where, where the Bible comes from, why is it you have to believe the Bible and the resurrection. In fact, so, you know, and, but sometimes when I would get onto those topics with people that have that sort of attitude, they would start to say things like, oh, you know, well, why aren't you focusing on like preaching the Bible to them, you know, rather than, uh, you know, going into creation and evolution, going into facts about the resurrection, going into like Bible versions and all these sorts of things. Well, it's because, like I said, not everybody has that upbringing where they've just accepted everything the King James Bible says. They need that groundwork that maybe we already have as starting assumptions. They don't have that. So we need to understand that, you know, going and preaching the gospel is more than just having the five points of salvation and assuming that everyone believes the Bible is the word of God and then just doing that and think you've done your diligence. You know, I think being a soul winner like Paul required more than that. And we can see here the three Sabbath days. And later, we're going to see how he addressed even the Athenians, where you can see it's a completely different approach to how he addressed the Jews, right, in, in this chapter. Let's continue, uh, Acts 17. So, but the Jews, which believe not, moved with envy. So now you can see here the persecution of the people in Thessalonica that believed, and not only uh, you know, of Paul and Silas and the people that were with him, but the people, obviously, that they had won that were helping them in this city, notably uh, Jason. Uh, but, the, but the Jews, which believe not, moved with envy. See, what was the envy? Because this is, you can see that for them, it wasn't about the truth. It was just about getting followers, you know, and who had more influence. They don't, didn't care so much about what was actually true and right. Took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. So you can think about that is, you know, people that maybe are not so virtuous, lower moral standards, gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So the thought here is that people that reject the truth are happy to team up with the ungodly as long as it's against the truth, as long as it's against the gospel. You know what this, and you know when I read this, you know what it reminds me of today? It reminds me of how the Muslims have just teamed up, teamed up with Andrew and Tristan Tate, and now they're just like, you know, pushing Islam. So it's like, it's like the Muslims, they don't care that Andrew Tate preaches like materialism and, you know, he's a woman, you know, they, they, they make it all that womanizing and about material possessions and about, you know, just their, their ungodly lifestyle. Who cares about that? The Muslims don't care. As long as they're Muslims, you know, they say they're Muslims. I don't even know how closely they practice Islam. But they're happy to band together with them and preach Islam, even though these people are completely terrible uh, examples of what you would consider a fundamental Muslim. So what, what, it, what my thought here is, or what, what it made me think of here is, you know, these Jews who are moved with envy, they, they're not so concerned with the truth or good example. They're happy to just band together with the ungodly, certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, right, as long as, as it is against the truth of the gospel. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. So a couple of things on that verse is, isn't it, isn't it such a great thing 
that this is the criticism of the Jews and the certain lewd fellows of the baser sort against the apostles, that they are having too much of an impact, <laughs> that they have turned the world upside down. They have heard of what is happening in these other cities, and it's like now they've come here. Their influence is here. And, you know, that's an encouragement to us that, you know, sometimes, you know, if you don't have enemies in this world, well, maybe it's because you stand for nothing. Maybe because, because when you have an impact in this world and you're making a difference, there are going to be people that oppose you, just like here. They are turning the world upside down. They are having a great impact and they are making enemies, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We're not out there to make enemies. That's not my point. But when we go out there and make a difference, there is going to be people that don't like the, the changes that are happening, right? So here, the same. It's an encouragement here that, you know, what's their accusation? These guys are too effective. They are changing things and we don't like it. And this is what they bring Jason. And look, notice that they're, just, they're not just persecuting the, the leaders of the movement, like the Paul and Silas. Anyone that is associated with them is getting persecuted too because Jason, you know, maybe he's a bit more of a, a, a not so well-known person in that area, but just because he helped them, he's getting dragged into it as well. And that's what happens today. It's like, you know, in, in all the, uh, you know, the, the back and forth that happens in the political sphere or the public sphere, you know, even if you stay neutral, they try and make you take a side. Even if you're sympathetic to a certain cause, now you're a racist, now you're a bigot. Well, the question is, are you going to stand for what's right? You know, Jason was brought before the rulers, you know, and he didn't back down. And I think, you know, we should take that example from Jason that, hey, you know, if, if, you, if, if you want people out there making a stand, preaching the truth, you know, putting their head above the parapet or, you know, taking those arrows, when they take those arrows, you should be like Jason and stand with them. You know, because often many times I've seen in churches where the preacher comes under persecution, that's when people start leaving the church. Oh, you know, oh, we don't want to be like public people. We don't want to be associated with that. I mean, you don't want to be a fair weather friend, you know, where you're with Paul and Silas in the good times, but in the bad times, now, you know, you, you, you forsake them. So you want to be like Jason, where you may, you know, be caught up in the persecution, but look at what Paul said. Remember when we, when we read the epistle to the Thessalonians, that he thanked them and he was grateful for them and he praised them because in persecution they stood with him. They understood what it was like to be persecuted too. And we see that in Acts 17, whom Jason had received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And, you know, maybe this is why Jason's name is mentioned in Acts 17, because, you know, he, he came under fire and God honored him for it, uh, you know, in, in being associated with the apostles. He, he was not the one spearheading all, all the, maybe the things that were happening in Thessalonica, but just giving them a place to be and to stay, he, was, he came under fire. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go, right? So they were, you know, so maybe they're saying, yeah, well, you know, we won't do it, but then he, you know, uh, got them out of, uh, got them out of um, Thessalonica to Berea. So if you live a life without making any enemies, it's probably because you stand for nothing. Right, that you're not making a stand. You know, anyone can light the candle and put it under the bushel, right? But then will you light the candle and put it on a housetop? You know, and yes, you may uh, receive persecution for putting your light on the housetop, but it's also going to draw some fire as well. But you, you should be encouraged that it's like here. You know, the persecution comes because these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also, so don't be shocked when you are having an impact that you, you face opposition. 2 Timothy 3.10 But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, 
charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, so we talked about those in previous acts, uh, chapters of Acts, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 10, 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So you see, Christians that are living godly and are having an impact are going to have enemies. If you think you can live a godly, impactful Christian life and just fly under the radar, then you've got a question like, well, how godly and how impactful am I actually being? Because, you know, if I can just fly under the radar, nobody really knows or nobody really cares what I'm doing, it's probably because you're not really doing much for the Lord. Because the Bible says here, they called the master, they called Jesus Beelzebub. How much more shall they call them of his household? All right, so that's Thessalonica. Let's go on to Berea now. Berea, you know, Acts 17 is very famous for that verse in 11, where you say, hey, it must be like the Bereans, search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. And we talked a bit about that last week. But let's, uh, let's look at them now in Berea, Acts 17.10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So the same, when they went to Thessalonica, they went into the synagogue of the Jews, they're reasoning them in the Sabbath days. Now they're doing the same in Berea, right? They went to Berea and went into the synagogue of the Jews, preaching, you know, the resurrection, preaching the, the gospel. And verse 11 is the, is the famous verse that we, a lot of us know and people know because the Bereans were people that searched the scriptures. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. So the reason why I brought you to the Thessalonian chapter and talked to you about how Paul praised the Thessalonians and the sort of church the Thessalonians were is because in verse 11, now you get an idea when the Bible says these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, how highly God thinks of people that know their Bible, right? That that don't just accept things that they're told because of the person that's delivering it to them. So he says it's a very noble thing in the fact that he is saying that these people are even more noble than those in Thessalonica. And you can see the sort of things that Paul said about those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Right? So they were open to hearing and they wanted to hear and understand what was being preached and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Look at this passage in 1 Thessalonians 2, where Paul refers to how the Thessalonians received the word when they came to preach them. He says here to the Thessalonians, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So this is how readily... The Thessalonians accepted, you know, it's just good that they accepted it as the word of God, which it was. The, the Bereans, though, the Bereans accepted it in the same way, but they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So now this is where Paul like I said, if you understand Acts and the things they go through, you can get some insight into the mind of Paul as he is addressing the Thessalonians and the things they went through. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are con contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So you see, so what was happening there is the Jews were trying to stop Paul and Silas and his company from reaching more of the Gentiles. How evil, you know, how evil it is that you reject the truth and then you don't even want others to have an opportunity to hear that either. So, the Bereans, I won't talk so much about, you know, hey, making sure you know your Bible and stuff like that because that was last week's sermon. 
But the point I want to make here is the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians, who were praised quite highly by Paul, if you see in the Thessalonian books. They searched the scriptures daily. So you don't want to just accept something on the account of who someone is. So just be careful of that. And don't do that with me either. You know, I want you guys to have a good foundation in the Word of God that you don't just believe things because that's what, you know, Victor teaches. You know, you never want to say to somebody, oh, I believe this because this is what my church teaches. This is what Victor says, so that's probably right. No, don't have, don't be like that. You know, be like the Berean and search the scriptures daily whether those things are so, so that you have a good solid foundation of knowing the Bible. And, you know, having a good solid foundation of knowing the Bible is not just knowing the scripture that backs up your point. You want to get to the point where you understand all the scriptures that are related to that position and understand how to explain them all. That's when you've really arrived at a sound position, right? You've arrived at a sound position where not only do you know how to use the scripture to explain your position, but you also can explain the potential objections from the scriptures and other places in the Bible. That's where you want to get to. It's like a fight. In a fight, you can't just learn how to punch pads. It's like they say, you know, in like UFC, like, you know, if somebody's like, you know, boxing and then you sh they show a video of a person like, you know, punching pads and even like little kids, they can remember all these different movements and it's like, dish, 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 dish. but people say like, you know, but pads don't punch back, you know, so you can have all your verses saying, oh, this is why I believe, this is why I believe that, but have you battle tested it? You know, this is why you go soul winning, because then you battle test it. And people maybe throw objections at you and you answer questions and then now you learn to defend because you know what? Pads don't punch back. But when you try and preach the gospel to people, they throw objections back and then you get a bit of practice in this, uh, in this spiritual fight. So you want to be like the Bereans. You don't want to just accept something on account of who it is. You need to prove all things, Right? 1 John 4, look what it says here, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Right? So how do you try the spirits? So the spirit of God is the word of God. So how do you try a spirit? A false spirit is usually uh, known by the words that is being spoken. So you, you, don't, you don't need to separate spirit and words too much. You know a false spirit because it's the false words. Just like you know the true Holy Spirit, it's the word of God. So how do you try the spirits? It's not an emotional thing. It's not a feeling thing. It's you try it because of the doctrine, the words that you're hearing, whether they are of God, because many false prophets. You see how you try the false spirits? Because the false prophets of a false spirit got the false doctrines. I've gone out into the world. 1 Thessalonians 5, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So this is a very important thing because in the Bible, men are not lifted up so much to the point that they supersede the Bible, that they cannot be questioned. But, you know, like the way man is and like the way it is in some denominations, some cultures grow up with this idea that you cannot question the man of God. You can't, you know, in, in fundamental Baptist churches, like, don't question the man of God and the anointed of God. And then you'd have that in Catholic churches as well and in Orthodox churches that, you know, they see it as disrespectful in questioning what is being taught or asking questions. Now, there's a disrespectful way to do it, obviously. But what you have to understand is that the Bible does not teach that we just accept something that is said on the account of who says it. I mean, look at what Paul, Paul is praising the Bereans for being noble, for searching the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And look who the preaching was coming from. It was coming from the Apostle Paul, right? So don't you think the Apostle Paul is lifted up a bit more than even the bishop of a church or some priest or some bishop somewhere else or some other religious leader? Of course. So of course we need to do it in a respectful way. Like in 1 Timothy 5, it talks about how you can approach elders rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. So you can do it in a respectful way, but this idea that it's disrespectful to question at all is not something that is biblical. It's not something that should, should be 
belief, right? We want to know the Bible. We need to prove all things. We need to try the spirits. And we need to search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. All right? Acts 17, 12. Therefore, many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So notice the difference there between the Bereans and the Thessalonians. So the Thessalonians didn't search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so, the Jews. Some believed. But here, because then the Bereans, they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. So a lot more Jews there. You know, believed. So you can see there that the faith is linked to the, your knowledge of the Bible, right? But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So again, the persecution followed them to Berea, and that's what brought them into Athens. So notice there that the, the faith of the Jews there was proportionate to their searching the Scriptures daily, right? So faith is not just a feeling, right? Faith is not just like Dorothy, Wizard of Oz, you know, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, I just believe, 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 right? That's not what faith is like. Faith is believing in something, right? So this is why, how do you increase your faith? You increase your faith by knowing more of God's word. This is why in Romans 10, 17, it says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we see that difference there between the Thessalonians and the Bereans, right? In terms of the impact that the word of God had and why the Bereans had more faith, because they knew the word of God better. All right, last section. Let's just talk about what Paul experiences in Athens, in Athens, right? Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So notice there, Paul is waiting for them, his, his, his companions at Athens. And he sees the city and all the idolatry going on in Athens. And he's got a burden there for the lost. And, you know, my question to you is, you know, do you have that same burden? You know, you see the way our country is going. You see around us as Muslims and Buddhists and atheists and you know, every status that people look at, you know, Christianity is just going further and further down the tube in terms of people leaving the church and Christians growing up and, you know, not being believers. Do you have a burden for that? Are you like Paul, where it's stirred in your spirit and, and, and it doesn't sit right with you? And look at the burden that Paul had in Romans 9, verse 1 to 3. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness and continue sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So you see, he had a burden for the lost that he wished that he may have been sent to hell so that others could be saved. But, you know, do Christians now even have a burden to want to go street evangelism, go preach the gospel, I mean, it shouldn't sit right with you guys. You know, week after week after week, you come to church, you know our purpose here is to preach the gospel. But then week after week after week, you know, you're just fine with like not being involved in evangelism at all. You know, it's like, that's not right. That's not right. Like what, what should be right is like you have a burden like Paul does when he's there and his heart is like stirred that, man, I need to try and reach these people. That's why it says his heart was stirred. So then he went into the synagogue and then now he's like, it's disputing. See how it, it, it made, made him take action, right? He didn't just get stirred and do nothing about it. And this is the problem here with these Athenians, right? So you want to have a burden for the lost. Now, not only do you want to be a Christian for many, many, many years and then not doing any, any evangelism at all, but sometimes Christians who know the truth, know the gospel, are friends with like atheists and people from other religions for years and years and years and years, and they never even mention the gospel once. You know, you've got to have a burden for the people around you 
and bring up these things. You know, maybe uncomfortable, but try and talk to them about it. I mean, don't you love them? Don't you care about them? Like Paul did. I mean, Paul wished that he could be accursed for their sake. Let's have some of that attitude in our in our Christianity. Verse 18, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So they don't really understand what he's, what he's saying, but they're hearing about you know, God in the flesh, God manifested, but Jesus resurrected from the dead. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would therefore, we would know, we want, it's like basically saying, we want to know therefore what these things mean. So they're interested, they're curious, they want to know, hey, what's this new thing that we haven't heard about? And this is where I want to focus on this verse here. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So don't be, don't be the Athenian Christian. Right? What's the Athenian Christian? Where you're all talk and no action. Right? Christians, they want to get together and they want to talk about doctrine and they want to talk about this issue and that issue and they come to church like the Athenian, right? Oh, they just want to hear, oh, what's the new thing that's going to tickle my ears? Oh, I'll get upset. Oh, I can't believe they're doing that. They go home, nothing. No soul winning, no activity, no nothing because you're no better than these Athenians where it says, which they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So don't be like the Athenian Christian where you just want to hear about this new thing and that new thing and, oh, what's the latest news and what's the latest thing here? And you just don't even talk, 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 and then you just go and do nothing, right? That's the Athenian Christian. Don't be like that, you know? Don't just get angry about things. Get active. 1 John 3, 16, look here. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So you see, the love of God was not just talk, it was action. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? You see how if you just want to know things and don't have any action, don't have any work for the Lord, your love for God is cold. Right? How dwelleth the love of God in him when you see the needs in the world? Like Paul, he sees the city given to idolatry and you're not stirred at all. How dwelleth the love of God in you? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You see what the Bible's saying here? Don't just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. You've got to be a Christian of action. Don't be like an Athenian Christian, you know, like, like the Athenians here, specifically in Acts 17, obviously not talking about just all people from Athens, but like we see here, the Athenians and how they're being uh, talked about here. 22 to, uh, to the end. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Right, so he's, he's addressing now a Gentile audience a pagan audience that just has all these false gods. So he's seeing the city given to idolatry and he addresses the things that he's seeing. For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So sometimes Christians, they, they practice their Christianity a bit like a pagan where they just do things just in case. You know, you got to be careful because sometimes people, you know, baptize our kids just in case. Yeah, I better go to church, like just in case, just like cover all their, their things. It's kind of like here. They don't know really the truth and they don't think they have all bases covered because they don't have the truth. So they have an altar to the unknown God. So there's all these gods, you know, you think about all the Greek gods and all this and that. But just in case we've missed one, we've got an altar to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So Paul actually uses this altar to the unknown God as a way to bring in, hey, well, the unknown God is actually the true God that you don't know. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath 
and all things. So what, what I want you to notice here as we go through just these last couple of verses with Acts 17 is, you know, Paul is taking a completely different tact with the Athenians as he does with the Jews. See, when you see the Jews, it's like, well, the scripture says this, it's written here, it's written this, this is how Jesus fulfilled the scripture. So going back onto my original point at the beginning where, you know, we have to take some time with people that are from different backgrounds, we see this in Acts 17 where Paul is addressing Gentiles with different backgrounds. He comes at it from a different angle, you know? He, but you can see here that Paul also under, he took time, notice, to understand their religion, right? Because how, how else, how else, how, otherwise, how else did he know that they had an altar to the unknown God? So notice how he took an interest to go, I'm going to see like kind of what these guys believe and then relate it back to, you know, try to give some truth to them. So it's no different to like say, you know, if you understand a bit of the Quran, you know, a lot of people make the argument that, hey, you know, the Quran tells people of the book to search their scriptures and then they'll find the truth too. And then you kind of like use that to like tie it into, well, you know, well, this is the scriptures that are there at the time and facts and things like that. So that's a similar thing to like what Paul is doing here. He is understanding what they believe and then using that, he's going into creation and using their logic to say, look, well, if there's a God, obviously God is bigger than just the stones and things and the idols that we can make. He's greater than that. He's, he's made this creation. So, and then he goes into the resurrection. So the, the same way that we kind of argue when we are talking to people not of Christian background is very similar, right? We try and understand what they believe. We try and tie it in. We talk about creation. We talk about the resurrection and then... You know, we give them the truth, and it's, it's a very similar thing that Paul is doing here. Hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So he's saying here, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I sort of developed my own approach, but then I was looking at this chapter and it's like, oh gosh, like, like Paul does the exact same thing. You know, when you talk to somebody that doesn't really know anything, sometimes the first question you ask them is, well, do you think there's a God? And you talk about creation and evolution, you think, don't you think God wants to communicate with us? He's not a God, that, a God that's far off. And it's the same here. He's saying there's a God that made the world and he's like, and he wants people to seek him. He's not a God, God that's far off. And this is why he has like communicated with his creation, you know, and for in him we live and move and have our being. As, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So you see how he understands what they believe. He understands their poets. He understands their idolatry. And he's saying, hey, look, he's using the logic to say, look, you believe that too. You believe as well that, you know, we are offspring of God. So then therefore, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God is like unto gold or silver or stone. So he's saying, you even believe that we're the offspring of God. So how can God be like these rocks and stones that you worship? You see how he's like, using their own logic to like break down what they believe and bring them to the truth. We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So now he's saying, now you've got to believe the right thing. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So you see how he goes from creation, thing, lo the logic, but then he's like, this is where I'm bringing you to Jesus, giving the facts about the resurrection. And then now he's preaching why they need to believe on Jesus. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Some people are going to accept it. Some people want to hear more. That's evangelism. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed among the which was Dionysius and Areopagite, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So I think Acts 17 is a really great chapter. Look, a lot of, you know, you don't always realize what, what all the truths there are in these chapters until you sort of break it down and look at them, and you can learn a lot from them. So I hope these uh, chapters have been profitable to you. But, you know, Paul here is really showing us what it means in Acts 17. He's showing us the, the whole idea of 1 Corinthians 9. 
My first Corinthians 9, 19, For though I be free from all men, yet I, I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain them all. And unto the Jews I became as, as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. So that's why he's going to the synagogue. He's preaching from the Old Testament. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Right? So, the main lesson here, in the last bit, is that, you know, we need to understand the beliefs of others. It makes you more effective as a soul winner. Paul ties in their ignorance, right, of the unknown God to preach to them Jesus Christ. He, he, he has different tacts for different people. So you may need to have a different approach for different types of people. You can't just have the one approach, the one cookie-cutter approach just for everyone. Yes, we teach, you know, you might start off with one approach, but then as you start to be more effective as a soul and you start to understand what people believe, you may develop other approaches in order to be more effective with them, to them. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So in conclusion, let's just go over some of the lessons we learned from this chapter today. First one is, you know, don't be impatient with unbelievers. You know, explaining the gospel can take time. You know, and don't have this attitude, especially when you go soul winning, that you know, if you're spending time talking with somebody, sometimes it takes time. Yeah, there are times when people are wasting your time. I understand that. But if somebody is learning, and you know, sometimes you have to break down all the objections and spend time with them. So don't be impatient with unbelievers. It may take time. If you live a life, what's another lesson? If you live a life without making any enemies, it's because you stand for nothing. Why? Because, yay, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, right? If you're going to be having an impact, if you're going to be turning the world upside down, you're going to, be, you're going to have enemies together, enemies as well. Now, when those people are persecuted, don't forsake them. You know, stand together with those that are persecuted. Don't be a fair-weather friend, a fair-weather Christian. When things are going well, you stand together. You're happy to be associated with them. And then when things don't go so well, then you forsake them. Be like Jason. Number four, don't just accept something on account of who someone is. I want to be like the Bereans. Search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. And in, in, in terms of Athens, Paul had a burden for the lost. Do you have a burden for the lost? You know, does it stir your spirit like it stirred Paul's spirit to want to be active? Don't be an Athenian Christian, right? Love indeed and in truth. And the last one, hey, be ready to preach the gospel. Learn how to approach different religions. If you want to be an effective soul winner, soul winner you're going to have to have different approaches. You're going to have to understand what people believe, and then you can use that to reason with them like Paul did. He reasoned with the Jews, but he also knew how to reason with the Athenians as well. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we uh, just praise you and thank you for your word. Lord, we just ask for wisdom. Give us wisdom, how to be an effective soul winner. Help us to be like Paul, where he was made all things to all men so that he might by all means save some. Lord, give us a burden for the lost. Help us to have an impact. And Lord, if we make enemies, I pray, Lord, that you'll give us the grace and the boldness to go through that. Help us not to intentionally create enemies, but Lord, help us to have the strength to go through tribulation if we are making a positive change in this world. So we thank you, Lord. We praise you. And I pray that you will use each and every one here for your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.